wanna see this. Yeah, yeah. Hey, AM to the PM, PM to the AM phone. Piss out your per diem, you just gotta hate them phone. If I quit your BM, I still rock Mercedes phone. If I quit this season, I still be the greatest phone. Everybody, welcome to Top Leaders Lesson 11. Taught Leaders is our way of giving back to our readers of Not Taught what it takes to be successful in the 21st century. This is the Bible and the guide that if you want to make it in today's world, you need to follow. Look, the uh, industrial age is over. All the things we were taught to be successful in the industrial age have ended. There are a new set of rules, new set of approaches, new set of strategies to be successful in the information age, and we are here to make sure that you know them so there are no excuses. Today I have an amazing guest. Her name is Tashi Yurik. I call her Dr. T, I call her T, I call her all kinds of things. She, she's from Boulder, Colorado, or at least she lives here now, which is right up the street for me. It actually blew my mind that she's a uh, New York Times best-selling author in this field and lives right up the street, and I never heard of her until I bumped into her by accident cruising the web. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's right down the street from me. So I'm super excited to have her. She's gonna talk about her new book, Insight, and this is going to help you primarily with deliberate learning, the deliberate learning chapter. So I'll stop talking. Dr. T, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for having me. Excited to dig into all this. You just dropped this book yesterday. Two days ago. Yep. It's day three. How's it going? Awesome. We're getting such great responses, and I've really enjoyed all the interviews I've done because they're so personal. This is such a personal topic for people, and I really hope it, it adds value to your listeners. Well, if it doesn't, we messed up, us together. So we will make sure it does. So with Indeed. that, with that talk, tell me, I, I know you get this all the time, so I'll try to make it a better question as you get going, but why? Why did you write it, and what is your personal driver behind it? Self-awareness has been something that I've been slowly but increasingly getting more and more passionate about as my about 15-year career as an organizational psychologist has progressed. And I think, you know, you can't ever trace it to one moment, but as close to that moment as I can identify, I was coaching a um, very senior level executive in a construction company, let's call him Steve. Yes, yeah, Steve, Steve is, is very famous in the book. And what I basically when I met him, he was completely unself-aware. And what I mean by that is he didn't know who he was internally. He didn't know what he valued. He didn't know what his goals were, what his strengths and weaknesses were. And he also, and this is even more important, he didn't know how people saw him. And so his team was literally quitting in droves. The company was doing poorly. He actually led the company's most critical business division. And so I was hired by the CEO to come and coach him. And it became very clear to me very quickly that this, you know, he was a wonderful man with wonderful intentions who was missing the boat because of a lack of self-awareness. And we worked together for the course of, you know, six or eight months. And he went from literally bleeding balance sheet, people quitting in droves, as I mentioned, generally feeling kind of stuck and unhappy himself, not just at, at work, but at home, to top performing business unit, they met their budget, people were actually happy to work with him, his family noticed a difference, and that, you know, that really reinforces the scientific benefits of, of this really critical skill, and we can talk more about that, but that was, I think, one of the moments that I said, okay, if Steve can do it, um, and he started off way less self-aware than most of us start off, although we usually think we're more self-aware than we are. Um, but if Steve could do it, I wanted to ask the question scientifically, what can all of us do to significantly improve? And the very interesting part, and what we'll talk about today, is what I found was not exactly what I thought I would find. And there were quite a bit of surprises, and the things we think make us more self-aware are not always going to work. You, I, I'm with you. As, as we talked before this started, um, self-awareness has been a, I guess I'll say a challenge for me, right? Or, or uh, it, it, maybe it was a challenge in the beginning and now it's a burden. I just was born with a very strong personality. Um, you know, I, people used to say I would create wakes and I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I, especially when I first got into the business world, I had no clue, right? So, um, so I'm fascinated by the world. So I was very excited when I saw, I think it's what it was, I saw the book and then that led me to you, and then that led us to here. So, guys, I, I want to make sure several times. Insight. 
why we're not self-aware as we think, and how seeing ourselves clearly helps us succeed at work and life. Insight, you've got to go get this. You need it, if no for other reason, your personal life. So the, the first question I want to ask Tasha, then I'm going to attempt a technical miracle, but we'll see. Why is it that we are not self-aware? Now, I don't mean semi-self-aware, but some people are absolutely, unbelievably off the charts clueless. Why? So here's, I'll start with a really scary statistic. In my research, I found that 95% of people think that they're self-aware, but the real number is closer to 10 to 15%. So what I always joke is, 80, on a good day, 80% of us are lying to ourselves about whether we're lying to ourselves, which is pretty scary. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's so much to this topic and it's hard to, to simplify it, but maybe I'll boil it down into three reasons that are worth mentioning. So the first is we have quite literally blind spots as humans. And what I mean by that is we can't appreciate and objectively see our, a lot of our behavior a lot of our thoughts even, our feelings, they're often visible to others, but we, we just don't have the capability. It's, we're not built to be able to see some of that. So it doesn't make us bad people, it just makes us human. The second reason is something that I call the feel-good effect. Mm -hmm. And what that basically means is, why would I look at myself objectively and honestly when I could just think I'm awesome, uh, regardless of what the actual truth is? Now, it's important to note that what I'm not saying is that self-awareness means feeling bad about yourself. If anything, it means seeing yourself, warts and all, gifts and all, and coming to a sense of self-acceptance and, and having power to improve. So then the third thing, and I, I hope we can delve into this a little bit because it's such a rich topic, is something we'll I called... Yes, let's do it. Okay. It's something I call the cult of self. And yes, basically, as, as, a, as a, not just, this isn't just millennials. Um, it's not just people in the U.S. It's, it's a worldwide phenomenon where we're all, we feel these societal forces to be more self-absorbed and less self-aware. So if you combine all those things together, it's no wonder that most of us have a lot more work to do than we think. And what I hope to do with this book, again, is not to make people say, oh gosh, you know, I, I, I don't even want to know the truth because it might be scary. What I want them to say is, I can learn so many powerful, even positive things that will help give me more control over my career and my life. Once I know the truth. Exactly. Because if you don't know the truth, you're just, you know, you're fumbling around in a dark room for the light switch and nobody wants that. Okay. So I like that. That was a good, technical, sound, structured answer. Now I'm going to try this, and hopefully I get it right, and then I, I need you to help me understand why these people don't see them for their – and it's so obvious. Like, like, like Steve in the workplace, I can understand how people miss it, right? But some things are just so obvious. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen here. Sorry for those listening to the iTunes. I'm jumping onto a YouTube – thing. Okay, we're going to American Idol. Try <laughs> Okay, can you see my screen? I can, God bless okay. it. Now let's listen to this gentleman. <laughs> like the sun going down on me. <laughs> Wait, are you doing that? Just a love fragment of your life to wander free. <laughs> But losing everything is like the sun going down. I, I, okay, on the moon. <laughs> Doc. Sorry. Doc. Okay, I get when people don't get certain things about them. Yeah. How is it that people honestly believe they're good? Look, I suck at singing. And here's what I wish I was singing. Like, if you could have one trait that you didn't have, because I got pretty lucky. I, I feel blessed. I got a lot of amazing skills and talent, so I feel like God gave me more than my share. But if someone forces me to sing once, I want to be a singer. I wish I could be a singer. I would sing, but I have to sing once, and I know that I suck, and I don't even get to try. So how is it Mr. 45407 here has no clue how bad he sounds? So a couple things I noticed. The first is he clearly loves to sing. And we shouldn't take that away from him, right? But but the objective reality is, right? I mean, and if, if he wants to do that in a, in a non-professional capacity, power to him. And actually, part of self-awareness is understanding what you love to do. And just because he's not great at it doesn't mean he shouldn't pursue it. But I think in this context, what I wonder is clearly he 
he practiced in front of people, right? His his family, his oh, friends. I hope not, actually. I know. I sort of hope that he just has, has never shared his gift with the world, and he feels like, you know, now's the time, and he just hasn't had any objective feedback. But, but that actually brings another kind of scary truth, which is something called the mum effect, which is exactly what it sounds like. In, in our society, at work, and even at home, and even with the people that we are closest to, it's very uncommon for them to tell us tough truths. And obviously, hopefully, everyone who's listening to this has someone that they know is going to say, you know, those pants do make you look fat. Yeah. But in this case, I wonder if this guy had somebody like that. And, and that's, again, you know, it's not that we want him to feel bad about himself, that he's, a, he's a, not a professional level singer, but he needs to know that to save himself. I mean, who knows how he felt when he watched it, but I think to, to be able to be aware of that, he might decide to audition anyway. But, it, but he needs to do that with a full appreciation of, of kind of objectively where he's at. So it's great. In the book, you talk about two things. You talk about how we, we perceive ourselves mm -hmm. and then how we, I'm going to butcher your words, but how we are perceived by others or how others see us, right? A little bit of a Jahari's window, right? How we see mm -hmm. ourselves. Uh, yeah. How others see us. yeah, Jahari's window, right? So I, it's awful that he would be victim of the mom effect. I mean, that anybody, would, he would tell any person he's going on American Idol, and someone would let him go. Well, let's assume there wasn't a mum effect. And they're like, oh, no, you, you suck. You shouldn't go. As you don't like me. You're not listening. Yes. So he clearly, like, it is so bad. I'm having a hard time how one can't self-identify with how bad that is. Because there's so many other singers in the world. You, it's not like you don't have a benchmark. Well, and that's another example. I mean, and not to put too fine a point on this, but but that's a situation where he li he probably sounds amazing in his head. And singing is a great example of something that sounds very different to us than it actually might objectively sound to others. It's like, you know, if you, gosh, I almost never watch videos of myself. I'm, I'm a professional speaker and I, I loathe doing it because I see myself and I go, is that really what I sound like? Is that really what I look like when I'm up on stage? And so I think that's a great example of something where that is a great example of a, a, a skill or a behavior that we can't be objective about. And there's a lot of others that, you know, people are really doing themselves a disservice by not getting that feedback. Wow. All right. Yeah. That, was, that was good. That helped me. He, he just can't hear. He hears it differently than the rest of the world. I feel bad for him. That's awful. All right. So we will shift. Everybody, make sure you ask your friends before you go on American Idol or the X Factor and make them tell you the truth because you don't want to be that poor guy. Takeaway um, one. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, right, so one of the things I wanted to, to move into is the seven pillars. And this idea of unicorns, you, you use them throughout the entire book of people who are really self-aware, who have amazing insight about themselves. Um, tell me a little bit about, walk, walk, walk people through the seven pillars and the, the unicorns. So let me start with the unicorns. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's such a, it's such a fascinating area. Oh, yeah, totally. So um, these are people who, very much like Steve, who's the executive I talked about earlier, they, they started out in their adult lives as either wicked delusional, you know, totally unself-aware, or even just, you know, they weren't incredibly self-aware, but they, you know, they had a lot of work to do. And so I found these people that had made dramatic transformations in their level of self-awareness. And the reason, and I actually started by asking highly self-aware people who had just always been like that to explain how they did it. And a lot of times when you're just naturally gifted at something, you can't break it down and you can't explain it. You just say, well, I I just try to examine myself and you know that wasn't it wasn't enough for other people to go on so I found these people and I interviewed them um, really exhaustively we actually searched around the whole world we surveyed thousands of people it was very rigorous because I couldn't just send an email to everyone I knew and say hey are you self-aware why don't you be a unicorn and be in our study so there was a lot of you know, hurdles, and I won't bore everyone with what they were, but we ended up with 50, 5 zero people who had made these dramatic transformations. And a lot of what I learned in the book and report on these sort of myths of self-awareness, we learned from them. You know, I would ask them something and say, they'd say, well, I don't do that, but I do this instead. And I'm sure we'll come back to that. But the seven pillars were based on um, a lot of sort of um, numerical analyses as well as our interviews with the unicorns. And what we found is they understood seven things about themselves 
that the average person typically didn't. So I'll kind of go in order. It's, you know, if you think about it, it's the most internal to the most external. Like people can see this, you can see this the best. So that first they understood their values, what's important to them. They understood their passions. You know, like the American Idol guy, he loves to sing. What do they love to do? Amen. <laughs> And the third is they understand their aspirations. What do they want, not just what do they want to achieve in their lives, but what do they want to experience? So kind of that greater drive. What do you, what do you want this earth to do? The next is fit. So they understood the type of environment that helps them thrive and be happy and, and get work done as easily as possible and be successful. The next was patterns. So what that means is, you know, I tend to be a fairly introverted person or I tend to be very gregarious at parties, just those behavioral tendencies. The next is what I call reactions. Um, and in a nutshell, that's your strengths and weaknesses. And the reaction is sort of how you behave in the moment that shows your strengths or weaknesses. So our American Idol guy, um, his reaction in that moment was singing poorly, <laughs> which, which was an indication that maybe he's not such a good singer. Um, and then last, the impact that we have on others is at the very top. And what's interesting is the lower down we go, the, the more of a, a judge we are, right? I mean, other people can give us feedback about our values and our passions, and it can be helpful, but sometimes we're in the best position to judge that. But as you go up the ladder, and you get to your impact, to your strengths and weaknesses, that's scientifically been shown that we're not as good of judges as other people are. And it's very frustrating for some people, and they, some people just say, well, I don't care what other people think of me. And I always feel sad when people say that because it doesn't mean that you have to be a slave to what they expect of you or to change your life because they give you a piece of feedback that you don't like, but you have to know, right? And, and you can compare that with your own perceptions and be in charge of it. Um, but, but those are the seven things. And I think there's, you know, different ways of finding out where you're at in each of them. I, I love those. And of course, in my head, I'm going through them all, you know, and, and processing where I am. And now I'm mad I didn't take your quiz, which we'll make sure we remind everybody at the end because yeah, I would know right. where I was and how self-aware I was or wasn't. Um, uh, but as I was reading it, one of the things came, came up, and I'm going somewhere with this, because I, I find this whole idea of self-awareness and, and whether someone is self-aware, isn't self-aware, and, and should they and should they not react to it and respond to it, et cetera, to be very complex, right? So one of yeah. your unicorns was Ben Franklin. Right? We think. And, we think. I couldn't interview him, unfortunately, for the yes. book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fair enough. We think. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if you did interview you, you look good. You look really good. <laughs> I know. Yes. All of our unicorns are currently living people. And then I talk about some folks like Ben Franklin, George Washington, that I think probably were. Yes. And you tell great stories. So this is this is actually even better than I thought it was going to be. So Ben Franklin was, was when you put up there and you use things like his temperance chart that he, he yeah. built the chart of his. I think he called them principles or his. His, uh, we'll go with principles, where he wanted to make sure that he acted a certain way every day and, and he actually tracked it. And he, and he followed many of your pillars. And when I was reading it, it reminded me of a separate story I'd heard earlier. And just, I'm a fanatical reader and podcaster and whatever. And, and he basically abandoned his family because he felt that they basically weren't trying hard enough, right? That his parents, who had helped him earlier in his life, um, became were destitute and moved in with his sister. His sister was married off at 15 to a man with uh, who was um, mentally ill and passed one of those kids, and most of her kids died. So her whole life she was spent trying to, you know, keep the family together and taking care of her grandkids and great grandkids. He's a millionaire, or the equivalent of a millionaire. He's building these statues to his family, but not helping them at all. Like so. I don't know if you had known about that before. Like, how do we reconcile those types of things? Is that a lack of awareness? Is that a lack of self-awareness? Is that, like, how would you play all that out? Now, and I want to preface this by saying I'm not a Benjamin Franklin scholar by any means, but I can offer maybe a couple of thoughts. The first is, you know, back then, so he, he basically left his family and moved to Philadelphia when he was very young. And back then, um, you couldn't necessarily go back and forth and see people and so a lot of it was I'm here this is my life and you know the people that aren't around me I, I just don't have interaction with them so in some sense I don't know how much we can fault him for that but I also think that he um, he seemed to be to hold himself to such high standards 
that maybe when other people didn't seem to uphold those same standards, like he has this whole riff on um, the on religious tradition because he thought that none of the religious leaders in his particular church were morally upstanding enough. And so I think there there was a hint of judgment to Except the guy who was a massive philanderer, by the way. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and a lot of none of the history books tell you that, but he had multiple yeah. failed businesses. He fathered an illegitimate son, you know, when he was younger. And this whole what, but I, what I think is really remarkable about him was he went through this and sort of had this wake-up call one day and he said I have to change my life I have to take charge I have to take control and I have to figure out how to live the values and principles that that I think are so important to me that clearly I'm not living and and that's why I think he was a unicorn he obviously was imperfect he didn't start out that way but he made um, amazing progress and if, if any of your your listeners and viewers are, are interested in American history his autobiography you can actually get it for free um, it's available for free on a Kindle version it is one of the most delightful books I've ever read he's so funny and so wise he's a he's a really interesting character he's amazing actually for the most part John Adams was an amazing one as well just the, the autobiography is about founding fathers, yeah, assuming yeah. we're getting the truth, right? And it's not butted up to look good, but I trust McCullough. They're, they're amazing characters. I mean, they really, well, really... Sean Adams had his faults, but <laughs> this isn't a history podcast, I guess. So we'll, we'll talk about that another time. Yes. Um, all right, so let's, let's move. So when you talk about the roadblocks and building blocks, I, what I liked about it is how you had three sections. So mm -hmm. folks, what you did is you broke this up into part one, roadblocks and building blocks. Part two, internal self-awareness, myths and truths. Part three, external self-awareness, external self-awareness, which is critical, myths and truths. And then her last one, which I really enjoyed, the bigger picture that talks about teens. And it's interesting, as I was reading it, I would make notes like, oh, I, I, would, I want to ask her about this, and how can a teen be self-aware? And as I got to say, oh, there she goes, she talks about teens. So as I was reading, I was, and you answered them as I went along in the book. So folks, no, if you have a question, you think it's incomplete, trust me, she'll get there. She, she gets there every time. There's a lot in there, yeah. <laughs> Prepare There's for work. Here. Folks, it is science. It is study after study referenced. It's phenomenal. So talk a little bit about the cult of self and, as you talked about earlier, this, this selfie culture or this, this whole – talk us about that. This is such a rich topic. Um, maybe I'll introduce it. I'm, I'm sort of curious what your reactions were too, but this goes back to this idea that we're all becoming more self-absorbed and less mm -hmm. self-aware. And there's a bunch of different things that have contributed to it, but the one that people automatically think about is social media. And guess what? They're right. There has been so much evidence that there's actually a causal link between how much social media we use and what our levels of narcissism are. So there's, there's one study, and I love to talk about this because it's so fascinating. They had, um, since psychology is the study of college undergraduates, right, it's what, what most researchers have at their disposal, this group of researchers had um, a bunch of students, and they broke them into two groups randomly. One group they asked to plot the route they took to school on Google Maps, right, so non-social media but on the Internet. And the other group they asked to spend, I think it was like 26 minutes on back then what was their MySpace page. And I don't know who is who is old enough and who is young enough to remember or not remember that, but it was the precursor, well, certainly me, I love to be MySpace page. So what they did then, so they had these students do this on the maps, um, on their social media page, and then they measured their level of narcissism. And here's what they found. They found the people that plotted their route to school had no increase in their levels of narcissism, but the social media people had a significant and immediate increase in their levels of narcissism. <laughs> and, it, and, and I think what a lot of people like about that is it feels true. Um, and, I, and I'm here to say that absolutely what you've witnessed, you know, everybody has that one narcissistic Facebook friend that has absolutely no idea how much they're annoying people. Um, th those things are contributing to a lack of self-awareness. And what we learned from our unicorns, just going back to your last question, very strangely was that they spent more time on social media than everybody else. And at first I thought, did I do these analyses wrong? And I did them over and over, and I, I said, no, this is what we found. So we started to look at how they used their time. Yes. And we basically found two groups of people. So there's, and, and these aren't my terms, but I just, I, other researchers have come up with them, and I think they're helpful. One group of people on social media are called me-formers. 
-hmm. And those are the people who go on and, you know, post a selfie with their um, latest professional award behind them. Exactly. Or, you know, it's their child's six and a half month birthday and they want you to know about it. Or, you know, they want you to show you the best vacation they're having and make everyone jealous. Those are me formers. Our unicorns were not me formers. What they were was another category called informers uh, who basically instead of logging on and talking about themselves, they would log on and use that as a method to improve people's day. They'd post, you know, one of, one of our unicorns is a photographer and she would post beautiful pictures that she thought would make people happy or calm. Or another unicorn told us he, he always likes to post jokes or really funny memes, right? And I think what's different about that is the focus. So what that shows us is you don't necessarily have to stop using social media. What I recommend to people, and this is something you know folks can do starting now, is spend the next 24 hours paying attention on and offline how much you're talking about you and how much you're talking about other people. And I, I tested all these things in the course of, of writing the book, and I'll tell you, for me even, the answers were very, very surprising. So it can be pretty informative. Man, I, I thought about that the whole entire time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really is interesting. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of social media, huge. So yeah. listen, and, and folks, in not talk, we talk about it, you have to be public. You have to have a persona. You have to have a brand. But one of the things we say is you have to be delivering value. It's interesting. In the book, I say, look, no one cares about you. What are you doing for other people? What are you giving them? So when you're creating content, the question is what value does that content create and for who, right? So we have a chapter on brand and we go through the whole thing about identifying a brand and what value that brand brings. So to your point about this, folks, it's, I think it's an excellent observation. It's social media is just a platform. How do you choose to use it? Do you choose to use it as a me former? Or do you choose to use it as an informer or a little bit of both? Say, I, I want to move on, but I have an interesting question because it gets so complex. Can someone who be an informer who knows their audience talk about themselves? So in other words, I know my audience, I'm going on vacation, and I know I'm going to a place that people would love to see, so I'm shooting my vacation because I know or have reason to believe that this is things people would want to see. My new, oh, my brand new baby, right? Brand new. I don't need the 37th picture of the brand new baby, right? But we just look, it's to all of you who are asking, right? So is there a middle ground there? Is, can... Oh, yeah. And, and I love that you brought that point up. I think that's really astute. It, it, I think it's about what is your whole persona? And if people perceive your persona as someone who's adding value, you do get a little bit more latitude, and, and that can bring you closer to your people, right? So, so instead of posting it to just be braggy, you're posting it to say, you know, here's an inside look at my life. And, and I'll tell you personally, that's that's been I have I have a great team of people that kind of give me advice on, you know, as an author, how to build a platform and be on social media. And that was one of the things, honestly, that was really hard for me was I, I kept saying, well, people don't care about my life; they don't want to know what I'm doing. Yeah, but they if do. you do it, <laughs> well, it's, and and what I'm learning is people need to connect with the person. So, yes. so I think it just depends on your goal. You know, it, you could post uh, a photo about your vacation with two very different captions that serve different purposes, right? You know, it might be, here's, here's a beautiful picture of a beach to brighten your day. Uh, miss you guys. See you when I'm back. Versus, like, this is the best vacation ever. And the subtext of it being that, you know, this is all about me and I have the best life. So, so it, it's kind of a nuance sometimes, but I do think you're right that for those of us that are, um, have public personas, you, you have to help people connect with you. It's just about how you choose to do it. You tell some really good stories in your book, really good stories. And you do a phenomenal job of balancing stories with the data and with the, yeah. the technical aspects. As, the aspects. Um, so as you sit and, and, and I, I see you popping up on social and I, I'm following you now, but I just a quick setup, I think you could do so much more. I mean, you, what, how you leverage your own experiences and your willingness to tell, look, telling a story about you sitting next to a friend, I believe her name was Tanya, who Teresa. was drunk. I'm sorry? <laughs> Teresa, yes, one of, my, one of my dearest friends. Terrible at names when I read them. But Teresa, who leans over and says, ooh, you've come a long way. Look, for all intent and purposes, that is social media. I mean, you just chose to do it in a book as opposed to writing in a blog post or doing a quick blurb um, on Twitter 
or LinkedIn and then linking it back to somewhere in your book with a picture. So you have you could really you could go a lot further with what you're doing if if you can get that out of your head. You know whatever that transition is because you have a lot to offer. Thank you. We'll have our one-on-one -on -one coaching session after this. All right. Well, we'll help each other out. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I I think you're right. And is there any other place you'd like to take us in this cult this cult of self? Because I really think it is a big deal. Is there something else our readers need to understand? Another place you want to take it before we move on? I think let's let so we dove into social media. The other main contributing factor to the cult of self has been the what I call the failed self esteem movement. And okay. anyone who's grown up in the last, you know, 50 years, honestly, has has been in a, a setting, usually at school, but sometimes at home and sometimes just in the greater consciousness, where everybody's special, everybody's a winner, everybody gets a medal. I talk about a school in my book in the UK where they literally don't discipline children. The, the children could do anything, and the worst the teacher can say, and this is real, is to tell the child, um, I'm sending you to another classroom so that you can get the love and support that they might provide. And then the worst case scenario, they can tell them, the teacher can tell the misbehaving student, you are emptying my resilience bucket. Which not only does it make any, not make any sense, it doesn't instill a sense of, of objective reality in these mm -hmm. kids, right? And so, so the self-esteem movement started in the 1950s, it picked up steam, it picked up steam, it, you know, might be cresting in some ways now. But the interesting thing is there has been research on why self-esteem is actually harmful in the absence of objective awesomeness since the early to mid 90s. So we've known for a very long time that self-esteem for the sake of self-esteem doesn't work. Now one thing I'll say is when people genuinely do a good job, when self-esteem follows excellent performance or working really hard or getting to a new level, um, that is absolutely helpful. But Even the problem, accurate self-esteem, not false self-esteem. Self yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's, it's self-esteem as a precursor to something. No matter what I do, I'm awesome, or as a result. I, I killed that presentation. I did an awesome job with that client. And, so, and I think the reason we still are under those illusions is it's a lot easier to feel special than to be special and to do the work that it takes. And so I think, you know, I sort of don't know where all of this is headed, but it makes me very nervous from a self-awareness standpoint that it's just, it's still okay, even though the data and the science are really clear that it's not okay. You had a great, a great quote uh, in the book. And by the way, I love how you bold, just really a lot of the unique things, people, that really make the book good. She bolds really important one line with four or five words. And, so that you know they're important. Um, but you had one, I can't remember if it was bold or not, but you said something like, it's easier for people to, to something about getting the self-esteem without working rather than working for the self-esteem. Uh, so, something like that. I made my daughter read it, unfortunately, because she's... What did she say? Now I'm curious. Well, she's 11. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to be careful because I love her to death, but I'm seeing lots of signs that there is just not very self-aware whatsoever, whatsoever, to the point of, quick side story, I'll let you run with this, and I'll pay the price later, I guess, but um, <laughs> we were all in a hot tub on vacation about six months ago, and my youngest, she at the time was just turned 11, just turned like a month ago, and my youngest was six, and she was getting out of the hot tub, and she was standing in the cold shower, rinsing off, and just standing there, and my 10-year-old, or 11-year-old, got up, walked over to the shower, pushed her aside, stood there, and just stood in the shower. Like, almost it was if the situation was an inanimate object. And I was like, whoa, what was that? And she, she looked at me and goes, what? What? We had like, like, there was no synapse firing that there was a person who was using it that was there, that she physically moved out of the way, that was no longer, it just, it just didn't connect at all. At all. So yeah, so I was reading this book thinking a lot about her. I mean, is that where it starts? Is that, is that... And, and again, I think it's it's sort of easy to blame young people themselves. And, and I, I joke that I'm the oldest millennial, so I feel like I have to speak on behalf of my generation. But I feel like it's so easy to just pin this on them. And, you know, there's a lot going on there and probably way too much detail to get into now. But the, the essence is pretty much 
all young people, no matter what generation they're from, tend to be a little bit more self-centered. Mm -hmm. But I also think that um, these forces, these societal forces, are hitting everyone right now. And it's, it's so easy for boomers or Xers or even millennials to blame other millennials when the problems are a lot deeper and they're a lot more pervasive than I think we want to admit. Great point. I, I'm going to keep going back to this. You're going to help with my daughters. I want to make self-aware kids. Self-aware kids. Self-aware kids. Point yeah. to Let's go into the idea of actually the self-aware myths and truths. There was some really good stuff in there. And, and what I'd like to say is for me personally, as I told you in the beginning, I was pretty unaware, and maybe still now, for all I know. I try really hard, but I still may be very un, un self aware not self-aware, whatever it is now. Um, but I was, when I first got in my career, I was really bad. I was sort of like a student. But there are a lot of myths, or rather, talk to us about these myths and these truths and the journey one needs to go on to become self-aware. So there, again, there's so much to this, but I'll pull out just a couple of points. Um, this goes back to the, what I said earlier, which is that most people that that are geared towards self-improvement, which you know I think is a lot of your listeners, they, they want to do the work and they're committed to it. But the problem is a lot of the things people just um, sort of automatically accept improved self-awareness. What I found in my research was that wasn't always true. So um, an example uh, I could give is journaling. So everybody says, well, if you keep a journal, it will help you be more self-aware. And that's not necessarily incorrect. The problem is that most people or many people are doing it incorrectly. So let me give you an example. Let's say someone is keeping a journal where they're using it as a way to just discharge all of their negative emotions. So they get in a fight with their friend and they spend 60 minutes angrily writing all their feelings. Research shows that if you do that and if you only use your journal to process your feelings, not only does it not create insight, which is what this is all about, but it makes you more depressed, it makes you more anxious, and the effects of that can last literally days and weeks and months after you have that journal experience. Because if you journal like that, that's similar to what you call in the book ruminating. Would that be ruminating? Exactly. It is. Ruminating is, is the evil twin of um, sort of uh, self-analysis or introspection where sometimes if it's hard and it makes us feel bad, we feel like it's helping. You know, oh God, I'm going to replay that horrible client presentation 20 times in my mind every day until I figure out why I suck so much. That's the wrong question. And so rumination gets us pulled in and not only are we less self-aware, but we just start hating ourselves. And that is literally the opposite of what we're after with self-awareness. So what, what, what are we after with self-awareness? What it feels like, you know, tell us, what are we after with self-awareness when it comes to at least us recognizing ourselves and being aware of ourselves? What are we after and how do we get it? So, oh gosh, that's such a big question. I think what we're after... I'm about to make you softball. I mean, I could really narrow it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're asking the important questions. I, I like the challenge, actually. It's great. So I think what we're after is essentially a, a sense of in, uh, sort of understanding who we are and how we're seen, being able to decide the things that we want to work on or the things that we want to simply accept. Remember, we're always in the driver's seat. And a sense of self-acceptance. Um, it, it's really easy to, to hear this about this book and sort of come away with the idea that self-awareness equals self-loathing. And it's really not the case. What was so interesting about our unicorns is they were more confident. Not only you know, do they have better relationships, they make better choices, they're more successful at work, they're happier, but they're more confident. And there's something about saying, I'm going to take, I'm going to make the commitment to myself then I'm going to question these assumptions that I have, and I'm going to try to get more data internally. I'm going to try to get more data from other people, and and I'm going to use that to assemble what I think is me. You know, who is it when I'm? Who do I see when I'm looking in the mirror? Um, and really looking instead of just taking, you know, sort of your previous thoughts or your assumptions as truth. Uh, a lot of times, and I think I said this earlier, but we find out things that are great strengths about ourselves that we never knew. I tell the story in the book of an engineer who thought he was a really bad influencer. Yeah. And he was in an executive education class I was teaching on, I think it was a strategic planning class. And he 
was amazing. He was the, the head of the class, basically, and everybody was high-fiving him and appreciating what he was doing, and he needed somebody, um, you know, in, in this case it was me, to hold up a mirror and say, this is the most amazing example of influence I've seen all week. So, so I think that's what we're after. Is it, it's not self-loathing. It's not figuring out how much I suck. It's about seeing ourselves for what we really are, warts and all, choosing to love and accept ourselves, and being in control of what, what we want to do about it. Why do you think people are so reticent to – So, and I'll let you go either way you want with this on this. So people who work for me – one of the things about me and the way I manage and lead is I'm very direct, but I'm very straightforward and honest, right? I will tell you, because I, so I'm the guy, I was reading your book, and I was, I'm the guy who says, oh, look, you've got lettuce in your teeth. I'm the guy that will tell you, I just met you. We're at yeah. a wedding, and you're sitting next to me. I'm that guy. I may lean in quietly, I may do a little, but I'm going to tell you, because I don't want you to walk around <laughs> with that, right? So yeah. if people work for me, I'm going to tell you, you're not doing it right, or you're not doing it well, there's areas for improvement. And what I've learned over my career is some people hate me and some people love me. There's very little middle ground. And as I moved to my career, I went back and I asked some of those people. Now, of course, the people that hated me, they really weren't, they didn't really want to talk. But I had to ask the people who worked with the people who hated me. And what I found, now again, this could be a lover, loving critic, but I, I tried my best, is the people who hated me didn't like the fact that I called out those things that made them uncomfortable. Right? So I became, I don't want to say a victim, I don't like that word, but I, I struggle with people who just don't want to know, and then they blame you, the messenger. Yes. Why is it people do that, and why don't people want to know? Because the cocoon of self-delusion is so comfortable and so warm, and we don't want to leave it. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about seeing ourselves with rose-colored glasses, you know, and, and at the end of the day, I think people have to make a decision. The decision is... Do I want to potentially limit my success? Do I want to limit my happiness? Do I want to let myself be stuck, you know, stuck in a career, stuck in a relationship I don't like? Or am I going to decide to, to learn the truth and to be open? And in your case, you found something that, that I found too, which is you can't force insight on other people. What I always recommend, especially, I mean, God forbid, if you have a, a delusional boss or a delusional parent or, you know, somebody that you see every day, that you not take that on yourself, that, that they they do not, nor should they be, have to be your project of self-awareness. Right. I do that. Yeah, and right, and I talk a lot of, about a lot of things in the book about um, focusing that energy on your own journey, about sort of looking at them with compassion, about controlling your own responses. And every once in a while, if you decide that you want to do that and you want to kind of reach out to them, that you do it smartly and you make that decision very clearly. I'm a fixer and it gets me in trouble. I try to fix everything. It's hard. I, I feel the same way, actually. And, and if anything, I've learned from this book that I should spend less time trying to fix other people and more time fixing myself. And I think that's a message of empowerment, right? Yeah. But notice our careers, right? We both chose careers that people pay us to go fix them. Whether it's yeah. individual or the organization, right? So it makes sure you think we got the fit part right, but, but yeah. I don't think when to draw the line might be our, our biggest challenge. Yes, I know my husband loves that. I'm like, I'm going to give you some unsolicited executive coaching, and he's always like, could you not, though? <laughs> could you not? Yes, I am the same way. Yeah. Um, all right, so I, I'm trying to find my – oh, here it is. Okay, so uh, before we move to the next one, I really want people to walk away with this. So someone's listening, we've convinced them, right? old saying, stop drilling, you struck oil. I want to be more aware. Can you be a little more specific, because you have some really good examples in the book, of how someone or what somebody can do to really begin the journey of understanding who they really are, as you say, warts and all? All right. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit specific so that I can give people something actionable. Um, but I will say that this is one of literally dozens of things. But it's, it's scary, and actually if you are willing to try it, I think what you'll find is it's not as scary as you thought it would be, which makes all of the rest of the work a little bit easier and a little bit more gratifying. So what it's called is the dinner of truth. Yeah, this and is good. Yeah, and I named this, but this was an exercise that I learned from a communications professor named Josh Meisner, and he uses this in his classes, and he's literally used it with thousands and thousands of undergraduate students. And here's how it works. It's, it's sort of shockingly simple. So you find someone in your life who, who you want, who, who's important to you, 
who you want to improve your relationship with, and you invite them out to a meal. And you give them a heads up, uh, because a lot of people don't like to be surprised by this, but essentially what you say is, um, I'd like to go to dinner, and I would like to get your honest feedback about what I'm currently doing that is most annoying to you. And then you zip it, and you listen. And you're going to ask questions if something doesn't make sense. Um, and the questions, it, it's, it's cheating if you say, you know, can you tell me why you're so wrong about me? That's not a question. But you could say, could you give me an example? Uh, could you give me another example? Could you help me understand exactly what I was saying or how I was saying it or what I was doing? Those are all fair questions. Sometimes people ask me, oh gosh, you know, I think I'm willing to do that, but what if the other person doesn't want to tell me? Um, so I think part of it is giving them a heads up. If they recoil or if they go like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that, what, what Meisner suggests and what I've found too when I've personally done this is to tell them, look, I am not going to be defensive. What I'm trying to do right now is just check my perception against yours. And I want to improve. I want to be a better you know, spouse, friend, parent, whatever, um, coworker, boss. That would be an interesting one. And yeah, help yeah. them understand that, that they're not going to get penalized. They're not going to get in trouble. And it might be hard to hear. Uh, it might take some mental preparation. I encourage people to think about just imagine the worst case scenario and what you would do if it happened. But then when you have it, um, it's pretty remarkable, actually. It's, it's not necessarily an easy conversation, but I've done it three times now. And what I've learned hasn't just shaped who I am and how I show up, but it's, it's really dramatically improved the relationships I have with these people. So it's, it's one of those things, you know, why wouldn't you do it? It's a little bit scary, but for all you can gain and all you can learn, it's, it's really worth it. I love it. I love the story of the gentleman that you got it from who came up with the idea in the truck with his kids. Wow. Um, oh yeah, and I'm going to do it with my kids. I mean, I, I believe I'm probably one of the areas of my greatest improvement is my awareness of how I come across to my kids. Um, and it also, in my opinion, creates one of the biggest challenges. So I'd love your thoughts here. You talked in the book about a woman who got some a 360 feedback or something, and basically the entire organization hated her, right? And then what you said was, upon further evaluation reflection, they all were just out to sabotage her, so she had to, so she could dismiss, for all intents and purposes, what they had to say. Well, that got my wheels spinning because that becomes, it's a final, it's a, it's on the border of subjective and objective, right? And so if we're not careful, if we don't like it, we'll always say, well, they have a grudge, or, which I have a tendency to do, which has burned me several times, is I just give it credence, saying, well, everybody's opinion counts. Yeah. And then I find myself struggling in a battle. I will never win because really they just want me to leave, and, right? And so they're never going to work with me. They're never going to. So how do you how do you balance that? How do you how do you figure that out? Probably what I would go back to for that question is what our unicorns told me, um, which was one of the things that I found really surprising. So when I asked them tell me about what your habits are around getting feedback from people. And what I expected them to say was, oh my gosh, I ask everybody for feedback. I ask everybody all the time. But that's not what they told me. What they told me was, I am incredibly picky about who I ask for feedback from and who I listen to feedback from. And, and we all have had this happen in our lives. Not all feedback is well-intentioned, and not all feedback is intended to be helpful. So what you have to do is be picky. And, and it, we were talking about this before we went on air, but the idea of a loving critic, yes. somebody who not only do you implicitly trust them and you know they want you to be successful, but they're also going to tell you the truth. And what I found is it's easy to find one of those things, but not both. For example, um, you know, when I wrote my book and I wanted loving critic feedback, who I wasn't going to send it to on the first round was my mother. God bless her. Um, she is a loving uh, non-critic. Right? She would say, "She would say, oh, this is the best book I've ever read, and it's perfect, and you shouldn't change a thing. 
but that's not what I was going for. But by the same token, I could have, you know, had people who maybe didn't want the book to be successful, you know, and these might be people that we know um, that are close to us in our lives, and, you know, that's what the word fremen frenemy was invented yeah. for. And so I think you just have to be careful, and I, I give a lot of examples in the book of, of how to pick that person, but at the end of the day, I think our gut is a pretty good guide. If, if that person doesn't feel right, and especially if they descend upon you with feedback, um, you might not necessarily take their word as gospel. What, what you might want to do is ask a couple other people, and then if you start to hear the same thing, um, then you might have a pattern that you need to pay attention to. Yes, you talk about patterns and the idea that says if you're hearing the same thing from all different people, then you need to pay attention. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I say one idea, one piece of feedback is an opinion, two is you know a trend, and then three is getting pretty close to a, what might be a behavioral fact for you. Interesting. So in the situation I described, let's say you get, oh, let me, let me go a different direction. So on the same note, though, so this idea, because I really think people struggle with this, and please tell me if I'm wrong, but as I read your book and I thought about myself and I thought about situations I've been in, I thought about the feedback I've had to give and get in the whole nine yards, there were different scenarios and situations, right? One of the, the, the ones is the idea that people may not, um, let's use the idea of coaching, like a coach on a football field. When you ask the kids what they think of the coach in the moment, when you have some examples of this too, in the moment or during the season or even the whole time playing, that he yells too much, he makes us run too hard. They're not happy, right? But then six months or I mean six years, ten years later, when they look back, they're like, oh my God, that was all for me. That was amazing, yeah. right? So, so how how would a coach? And I don't, if you haven't read this book, it's called Coach by Michael Lewis. Um, it's tiny. You can get through it in probably you get through it in five minutes. It, it's phenomenal. And it talks about a coach that all of these past players wanted to name the gym after him. But his current players in this next generation, the parents wanted him out. Like they wanted him fired. Because he was the type of coach who when they if they didn't perform at their best, not that they lost, but if he found them being lazy or a kid didn't show up to practice, he would literally run them till they threw up. Or he would literally, you know, make them pay, right? All to get them better and teach them a lesson. And so how does someone like that who knows himself and knows it's all for the better and knows that people love him to death, but this new group hates him, how do they balance that? Like, what do you do there? Yeah. And we've all had that teacher or that coach or that boss that really has that effect on us that we sort of, we hate it at the time, but yeah. when we look back on it, it's it's transformative. I, I, I can name so many people in my life that have helped me be who I am. But I think if you're that person, um, what I would suggest is to maybe be a little clearer about your intentions and about sort of what's what goals are behind that behavior. So to say, you know, and I, I actually worked for a boss that did this. She was, um, you know, a little bit hard on people. And I, you, I sort of heard rumors about her before I even met her, and I thought, oh, God, you know, she's going to be really hard to take. And one of the first conversations she had was, you know, here's my management style. Here's, here's what's behind that style and why I think it, it's important and here's what you can expect of me and, and to just be clear to say if you can expect this of me here's what I expect of you and get that contract clear and show them that there is a reason there's a method to the madness it, it can go a long way and I think it does a lot to build trust which is which is really critical for that type of situation that's a fantastic um, example because you also talk about that in the book, how you started telling people. You talk about a story. Again, you have great stories about yourself. You told the story where you got some really bad feedback in, uh, about one of your present, a day-long seminar or something where someone yeah, says, oh, yeah. fantastic. It, it just sharing somebody else's dribble and da, 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 we all knew and you were just mortified. And then you <laughs> ruminated. Right? Yeah. If I remember all this correctly, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember it very clearly. <laughs> and um, – and, but what you what you said was how did you come out of that? You you um tell people how you came out of that and how you got oh that you started telling people up front mm -hmm. that yes some of this is mine but some of this you may have already heard before but I'm really good at um, synthesizing complex things and easy so tell people a little bit about that yeah. story. So one of the things I do in my consulting practice as an organizational psychologist is I run leadership programs, and that might be for you know an entire level, like middle managers or frontline leaders, or it might be a high potential program of, of up-and-comers in a, in a big company that they want to really kind of 
uh, disproportionately invest in. And I, it was actually for a public sector organization, um, heavy union environment, there was a lot of tension, a lot of just like stuff going on. And we did a survey where we said, um, so it was a program, it was a year long, and we, we got a lot of great feedback. We, you know, what do you like about the program? What could we change? It was all very productive, all very well intentioned, until I got to one comment um, that, you know, sort of in hindsight, I think there was a there was an important kernel of feedback, which I'll get to, but sometimes when people give us nasty feedback, it's more about them than it is about us. But the the sort of essential, like the, the message of the feedback was, you know, this is repackaged pop psychology and um, you know it's a waste of money and I can't believe how how much money someone can make from doing this. And of course I was shattered, right? Because the reason I do what I do truly is to help people be more effective at work. And and the fact that I get paid for it is awesome. And obviously, I, I would rather get paid than do it for free, but that's why I do it. So it broke my heart to hear this, and I, I ruminated for weeks, and I, I sort of started to second guess myself. And you know, am I am I really delusional about? I used to think I was a good consultant, but maybe I'm not. And so what I came to after talking to a very wise friend, which is a good idea when you're in that situation, was you know, she said he this guy clearly didn't want to help you. But is there a piece, is there a kernel of truth in there or a kernel of productive feedback that you can use? And I thought, well, um, one of the things I do in my leadership programs is I, what I don't try to do is teach people the newest fad. I try to teach them empirically supported practical truths, right, that might have been around for a while, but what I'm told is, is I, I am I'm competent at putting it into sort of an approach or a method that people can use right away. And so my friend said, well, why don't you just say that up front at the beginning of your programs? And so I started doing that. And, and, and to me, I'm actually really proud of that example because it is so difficult to go through that type of conversation, you know, to, to get the feedback and to figure out what you're going to do with it. But not, not every piece of feedback like that is going to have a kernel of truth, but I, I'm happy that I got something from it, and I, I was also happy that I sort of put the emotional side of it behind me, because it's, it's not going to help, right? You just want to figure out, how can this help me? How can I move forward? How can I accept who I am, right, yes, and try yes. to be better, um, and know that I am a good consultant, um, but, I, but everybody has work to do. I love, I, I was hoping you'd take it that way. That was, I think it's a good way for us to start to tail off, is... Mm -hmm. Look, you got some information that helped you realize something about yourself, right, wrong, or indifferent, right? That, yes, you do your own studies and you've, and you've done some amazing studies, but you also leverage those of other people. And so, therefore, understanding that impact to your potential audience allows you to be more effective by giving them a heads up and letting them know where they're coming from this. So, yeah. without that kernel of information, it didn't mean you're any less or any worse of a consultant or a practitioner but their impact of the value you could deliver to those around you was mitigated. So I loved how you wrapped that up, but I think that's a really good uh, synopsis on the idea that says this isn't about self-esteem. This isn't about, um, you know, as you put it, you know, making yourself loathe who you are or finding you what so people can poke fun of them. It's really just about understanding the accurate truth about who you are, how you present yourself, or how you play out to other people and those around you, how you make them feel. You know, go... Oh, I, I thought you were about to say something, so I wanted to let you have the floor. Oh, sorry. No, I was saying yes. I agree. Yeah, so I think that's – I really think that's the biggest thing. And I also think this is hard. If I can say this, then we're going to have Brady come in here in a second and wrap it up and talk about your study. But I really think this is hard, too, because for me, as I was sharing with you, and I'd like you to, to sort of give your thoughts on this last piece, is how – yes, we can get feedback from others and – and, and yes, we can, you know, look at ourselves, but there is a game that our minds play with us is what, am I being honest with myself or am I not being honest with myself? And, and if it really is true that I'm not a certain way, but I'm afraid I'm lying to myself, so I pretend that I'm that negative way even when I'm not, like, how do we put it in the right places so that we know we're not lying to ourselves negatively or positively? Yeah, yeah. So the way I can summarize this maybe is to – to take the scariness, um, excuse me, out of the process of self-awareness. It's, I think we, we sort of imagine that we're going to have these lightning bolt moments where everything becomes clear to us. So we have this, you know, incredibly powerful, dramatic life experience that teaches us who we are. But it's not really about that. What I found with the unicorns was they were more likely to gain insight in more everyday situations. 
And what I love about that, and what I think maybe is a good sort of start to the conclusion of this, is um, it's not about those big moments, it's about the small moments. It's about every day waking up and saying, I'm going to question the assumptions I have about myself. I'm going to dig a little bit deeper. I'm going to get just a little bit more feedback. And if I get a small insight every day, that's going to add up to be dramatic. Um, and if I look at the unicorns, the large majority of them did it that way. They, they did it incrementally, you know, sometimes spurred by a big event. Um, mm -hmm. But they did the work and they put in the time. And I, what I like about that is it's just so accessible for the rest of us. It's less intimidating if we think about a little bit every day. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And Brady, Brady's going to come on. I think this is a way to start. Brady's going to talk. You have a really cool um, quiz to help people understand how um, self-aware they are. Um, and, and I want to say this, and you can tell me if I'm full of shit or not. But, and by the way, Tosh, you got to be the first guest I have ever had that I didn't drop an F-bomb. So you got to <laughs> And I didn't either. That's good. Do you normally drop that bombs when you speak? What? Not in a professional setting, but you should hear ah. me personally. Yeah. I try oh, to be yeah. on that behavior. Back to, I know I do it. If you don't like that one guy who said, look, I'm never going to be lovey-dovey, and that's how I am, but I still care for you. But anyway, yes, you got me so enthralled. I, there wasn't a point where I just had to go, you know. <laughs> do it now. <laughs> yeah, right, right? Um, look, I, I can't say enough people how important self-awareness is. And I also believe, as, as Dr. T just said, this is a journey. You're never going to finish it. It's going to, you're going to struggle with it. You're going to make gains, fall back. You're going to question. But if you really embrace it, a word that kept coming through the entire conversation was open, right? Are you open? Are you open for what's coming in? Are you not, you're not a filter. You're not a filter where you only let certain things in and you're not a brick wall, but you literally open for what's coming in and then willing to process it and put it in its right place because this can make a massive difference in your life, starting with your own happiness and, and your own ability to move through our day-to-day. -day. I mean, everything, we're in, we human beings, we interact. That creates conflict, right? I mean, shoot, I'll just put it out there. I mean, Dr. T and I had a little bit of, I don't know what to call it, conflict, but I read something into her that she sent an email and I fired back. She's like, oh, I didn't mean that. And so we, you know, we didn't even know each other. And look, when you've got people you interact, and you read things and you operate and you you act the way that people see that you don't see. And if you can figure all that out, you're going to be better for it and you're going to be more successful. And in a world where te um, television is declining and people can see you more on social media, they can see you more on LinkedIn, they can see you more on video, you better know who you are and you better know who how you're coming across. So, guys, get this book, Insight. There it is. I don't know if it's coming upside down. By Dr. Tasha Yurik. She was fantastic. Why we're not as self-aware as we think, and how seeing ourselves clearly helps us succeed in work and life. Dr. T, tell us real quickly about this uh, test or test, I guess, quiz on telling us how self-aware we are. Quiz, I'll, I'll tell you real quick, but I might even throw it over to Brady to tell us her experience real quick. But if you are intrigued by this and you want to get a um, kind of a quick and dirty assessment of your current level of self-awareness, if you go to insight-quiz.com, it's a free 14-question assessment that you take and you send to someone that knows you. And once we have both sets of responses, we send you your report. Yes. Brady, tell us how you did it. What did it say? What did you think? Well, my quiz told me that I'm a, a pleaser. And this was kind of my average. I sent it to multiple people, uh, which it was interesting because it gave me insight on me, but it also gave me insight on my relationships with people. Uh, those who knew me the best ranked me as a pleaser. And I had to kind of think about that afterward of, oh, okay, well, these are people I've actually shared my goals and things that I've been disappointed with myself and what I want to do. And they were much more accurate in assessing me. Uh, and so the pleaser really came from those who knew me best. Those who didn't know me as well did not rank me as a pleaser. I have had a variety of answers. But it definitely takes a moment of courage. Uh, you know, you don't see what your friends say. You just see the results. And I did drop the link into the chat for everybody who's here live. So there is the direct link. But it, it was insightful. It was a little bit of what I knew. Uh, I had learned early on that I was a pleaser back in college. I kind of started figuring that out. <laughs> So where? See, yeah, it's a journey, right? That's great. Yeah. Yes. Well, 
I actually, I can say, honestly, I have my piano teacher to thank. Uh, she told me when she was like, you play for the audience and you're never going to play well if you play for the audience. You have to play for you. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's uh, so, yeah, that, that made a big difference. Uh, and I had, I had to really work hard at that, but I don't think I've fully ever worked it out of my personality. Um, obviously. Or should you, right? It's just a matter of bringing that internal piece a little, a little closer. That is awesome. This is true, but I highly encourage. It's very fun. Uh, my friends actually really enjoyed it, and I believe a lot of them ended up actually doing that with their friend base too. So it is awesome. a good time. I recommend it. Excellent. Everybody, again, www.insight-book.com backslash quiz. Can't mess it up. It's down here in the chat. For those of you watching on Facebook, you have to write it down, pause, write it down, whatever. For those listening on iTunes, do not write it down while you're driving in your car, but <laughs> go do it. Again, Dr. T, what do you want to leave us all with? Just everyday effort and a bold and courageous commitment to learning a little bit more about yourself is going to give you the most powerful rewards you can imagine. So I, I really appreciate having, having the chance to talk about this. Absolutely. So to put you on the spot, because you're good at talking about yourself, what is the most recent awareness that you discovered about yourself? Oh, gosh. Well, just quickly, um, I, I'm always working on being more vulnerable and sort of disclosing more about who I am in professional settings. And I, I thought that I sort of had that figured out and had that addressed. But even last week, I heard that um, I, I could be more personal. So that's something that I've, I've known for a while, but that I'm always, always working on. And I think, you know, part of it, it's what makes it so exciting is no matter where, how much progress we've made, there's always more progress that we can make in the future. It's, 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 it's fascinating that you just said that. Because I've, I've talked to you for an hour, and we exchange emails. In talking to you for an hour, I can absolutely see that you are extremely um, uh, engaging. What was the word you said you wanted to be more, or that, that trying to be more, what was the word? More personal. More personal, yes. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's sort of in many ways like myself, your just natural um, uh, persona doesn't deliver that until someone, until someone starts engaging and engaging. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those uh, people like you and I think like me and other people, I don't think everybody's like that. Well, they're natural, like they're happy as could be and they think they're being personal as ever, but it's just how it plays out doesn't resonate with people. That is hard. Like that that disconnect is really, really hard. And I I can see that. I can absolutely see that. And it I how do you say I got empathy for you. I I get it. Absolutely get it and I'm impressed that that's where you're headed, and but just for everybody knows, I've talked to for now. This lady's super personal. Super. Well, we introverts have to work harder than a lot of extroverts, so fighting the good fight every day. Well, you're winning. You're winning. <laughs> winning. You said, Dr. Tosh, I want to thank you for giving us an extra eight minutes. I know she's super busy. Um, it's go get her book, Insight, on Amazon, in all the bookstores, any other place they can find it. Your website, any other place. Nope, the, the, you can find it pretty much anywhere. But yeah, the website is the best place. Awesome. And I've got an extra one. i got to come up with a way to give it away. So um, thank you for the books. Everybody, thank you for your time, Dr. T. It was an absolute pleasure. Hopefully we live in the same state. Maybe one of these days we can get together for a, a drink and discuss this further because it was awesome. It was awesome. Awesome. Great to be here. Thank you both. Thanks, guys. Peace. We're out of here, people. Until next time, get your shit together. It's the 21st <laughs> century. You want to make it work, do the work. Become a one percenter. All right, peace. We're out.